Sure, I'm ready. Well, I wish you all a good day, and uh, let me start with my PowerPoint presentation. I'm essentially going to use uh, the findings of the fourth assessment report of the IPCC and uh, at least one special report that we have brought out recently on uh, renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation. Um, so let me start with the first slide. Um, as I mentioned, I am going to present to you some of the robust findings of the IPCC fourth assessment report. And before I get started, let me mention to you that the IPCC mobilizes the best scientific talent from across the globe. And to acquaint you with the manner in which we actually function, we start by first organizing what we call a major scoping meeting. Now, in the meeting itself, uh, we <clears throat> get around 200 experts, uh, people from governments and those who can contribute to defining the scope of a particular report. And this is often carried out over a period of a week or so, at the end of which we come up with the outline of what, let's say, the fifth assessment report is to be, or as was the case historically, what the fourth assessment report should contain. This is then presented to the plenary session of the IPCC, which is a fairly extensive exercise uh, <clears throat> where you have all the governments of the world uh, and we take decisions by consensus. Uh, once that is done, then the outline of a particular report is finalized and it becomes the job of the IPCC functionaries to see that we get the best authors for providing the inputs and the knowledge in keeping with the outline of the report. That's, that's when we write to um, uh, all the governments. Uh, we write to several other international organizations to send us nominations of authors. So we get their CVs. <clears throat> and to give you uh, a very simple statistic, for the fifth assessment report, we got around 3,000 no nominations, which was 50% more than what we got for the fourth assessment report. This clearly is an indication of the fact that the scientific community is very enthusiastic about working for the IPCC. Now, out of those uh, uh, 3,000 odd uh, nominations that we got, we selected about 830 as authors and review editors for the fifth assessment report. And that's when they start working. And just let me add a couple of other sentences on our functioning. Uh, at every stage of the drafts that we prepare, uh, these are uh, subjected to expert review. And we get a whole range of uh, comments from uh, the reviewers, <coughs> which incidentally have to be logged and uh, preserved. I'm sorry, I just have a slight throat problem, so I'm taking something that might help. Um, we, uh, we then <clears throat> log all the, uh, the comments that we receive, and the authors are supposed to either accept or reject them. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Those that we accept, we'll just record over there accepted. <clears throat> Those that are rejected, we have to give reasons why they're rejected. <clears throat> and all this is put on our website, so you know it's a very transparent system. All right. Now, um, what I also want to uh, mention is that at the end, the summary for policymakers, which is normally a small document, and a summary as it indicates, <coughs> is accepted <coughs> literally word by word <coughs> by all the governments of the world. And this happens in a plenary session, which is spread over approximately a week. All right, so now let me go ahead with the presentation. One important finding that we came up with was <coughs> the statement that climate change is unequivocal. In other words, on a scientific basis, 
this is an accepted fact. Climate change is occurring, and <clears throat> we can see that on the basis of observations. Um, now, the observations really consist of a number of measures that we have, and we also find, for instance, that uh, there are changes taking place in the frequency and intensity of several events related to the climate. I'll say a little more about this, but let me go to uh, changes in global average surface temperature. And you observe over here that uh, <clears throat> temperature across the globe on an average has changed over the years, and there are fluctuations in this variable. These fluctuations are the result both of natural as well as human-induced factors which bring about climate change. But what is particularly significant is the fact that in the past 50 or 60 years, there has been a perceptible increase in temperature, and the trend is quite unmistakable. Now, if we draw a line across the last 100 years observations, we get a slope which is shown here on the screen. Um, and this gives us a total increase during the 100-year period of 0 0.74 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> this may not seem like a lot, but if you look at all the changes in climate that accompany this change in temperature, then this is significant. I also want to emphasize that if you look at historical records going back geological periods, then the difference between the interglacial periods and the ice age that the world has been through uh, over long, long periods of time is generally around 4 to 5 degrees Celsius. So therefore, an average increase in temperature of 0 0.74 degrees is something that is significant and we cannot possibly ignore. What is even more important is that if we were to draw a line over the last 50 years, then that's deeper. In fact, as against 0 0.4 degrees Celsius in 100 years, this trend in the last 50 years would give us a temperature increase of 1.28 degrees Celsius in a 100-year period. So it's obvious that there's something happening over there in terms of acceleration in the increase of temperatures. And when our report came out in 2007, we also came up with this very important statement that 11 of the last 12 years rank among the 12 warmest years in the instrumental record of global surface temperature. So this is only to highlight the fact that warming is taking place at a much faster pace currently. Now, one important indicator of what is happening is the fact that bodies of ice over land across the world are melting at a very rapid rate. Uh, and this is shown by the cumulative balance of glacier mass across the globe. What you see in this diagram, and uh, I think we need to move to the next diagram on the screen, AIT and NUS, you might want to move to the next diagram. That's right. Um, what we see over here is the mass of ice in different regions of the world, uh, including Europe, the Andes, the Arctic, the Asian high mountains, which is the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush, Northwest US and Southwest Canada, Alaska, and coastal mountains there, Patagonia, and so on. Uh, the trend is uh, quite uh, a source of concern, as you will see. And we must remember that water supplies are actually stored in the glaciers. So you could easily call these the water towers of the earth. And if these are being depleted, <coughs> there's an obvious implication <coughs> in terms of the future flow of water that you would get from these sources. One area which is particularly vulnerable to this uh, trend is the South Asian region because <coughs> excuse me, we have estimated that something like 500 million people would be affected as a result of melting of the glaciers in the 
high mountains in this region, in South Asia alone, and something like 250 million people in China. So that's a pretty large number that's obviously dependent on uh, water that flows from these glaciers. <coughs> Excuse me. This shows changes in global average sea level, and in the last century, the increase in sea level has been of the order of 17 centimeters. <coughs> Again, you may imagine that 17 centimeters is not a very high number, but certainly if you are living in coastal areas or in the small island states, then 17 centimeters is a very serious increase in sea level. <coughs> because every time there's a storm surge, every time there is a, a case of coastal flooding, this higher level of 17 centimeters adds so much more in terms of uh, the damage that such an event would cause. Uh, so this is an issue that we need to be concerned about because it affects a very large population. We also know that across the globe, coastal populations are very dense and quite extensive in numbers. Let me look at the causes of change. And here, may I mention that despite the fact that in 1992, we came up with the U UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions have continued to increase. In fact, between 1970 and 2004, the increase was about 70%, 70, 70 which is really very serious. And that is affecting the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the increase in CO2 emissions was even higher, 80% during the same period. And therefore, one important finding that we came up with in the fourth assessment report was the reality that most of the observed increase in temperatures since the mid-20th mid century <clears throat> is very likely due to the increase in anthropogenic, that means human-induced, greenhouse gas concentrations. And when we use the term very likely, we are assigning a probability of 90% or more. So therefore, this is clearly a finding that should uh, give us a very clear uh, conclusion that human actions are affecting the climate of the Earth. Now, here, may I give you some projections for the future? Uh, we came up with uh, uh, a range of emissions, uh, a range of temperature increase based on different trajectories of emissions from 1.1 degrees to 6.4 degrees Celsius over the 21st century. However, in order to focus on what might be uh, what we call best estimates, we came up with the best estimate of 1.8 degrees Celsius at the lower end and 4 degrees Celsius at the upper end during this century, and that means by the end of this century. <coughs> now, this clearly is something that we cannot possibly allow to happen because if you go back to what happened in the 20th century, we had a temperature increase of 0 0.74 degrees Celsius. And let's say we were to add that to 1.8 degrees Celsius, uh, then in these two centuries, we would have increased the average temperature by over 2.5 degrees Celsius. And that clearly is not acceptable because it would be accompanied by impacts of climate change that are going to be particularly serious. Now, we know that climate change could lead to some abrupt or irreversible impacts. If you look at uh, uh, areas like Greenland or the West Antarctic ice sheet, then partial loss of ice sheets on polar land could imply meters of sea level rise because these are bodies of ice that are sitting on uh, areas of land. If they were to collapse and fall into the ocean, then that would cause a substantial amount of sea level rise. 
I've traveled to Greenland on two occasions. I was to go to Antarctica, but last minute mishaps, you know, bad weather or on one occasion I myself came down with viral fever. I couldn't make it to, uh, uh, to Antarctica. But going to Greenland was in itself an experience because this is a huge body of ice and Greenland, as you know, is the largest island in the world. I mean, Australia would probably be the largest island, but that's a continent. So next to Australia, this is the largest island in the world. And you have ice over there, uh, which is about three kilometers high. So just imagine the mass of ice that exists over there. And therefore, if there's partial loss of any of these ice sheets on these polar lands, we would have sea level rise of several meters. And that's clearly an irreversible and abrupt change that the world cannot ignore. We cannot predict that this will happen or uh, when it would happen, but it's a possibility we should be aware. I also want to mention the fact that 20 to 30 percent of the species that we assessed to be at risk of extinction that increases and warms exceed 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. And let me go back now to that best estimate of 1.8 degrees Celsius that I mentioned earlier uh, as the projection of this study, and combined with the 1.74 uh, degrees Celsius that took place in the last century. And the two together would give us an increase in warming of over 2.5 degrees Celsius. And therefore, if we allow things to drift and don't take any action, then even at this lower end of the so-called best estimate, we might create a situation where 20 to 30 percent of the species that we have assessed could be at the risk of extinction. We also know that the meridional overturning circulation, which is what you might call the Gulf Stream, which keeps Western Europe warmer than would be the case otherwise, uh, this is weakening. And as, as a result, it could have impacts on marine ecosystems and productivity, fisheries, ocean CO2 uptake, and terrestrial vegetation. All of this uh, can have very serious implications. Now, there are some regions which are particularly vulnerable, the Arctic in particular, uh, because the impacts of high rates of warming in natural systems uh, and the implications for human communities. Now, I might mention that uh, the Arctic is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the globe, and that's something to be concerned about. Again, I travel myself to the Arctic region and you see enough evidence of the rate at which melting of ice is taking place over there. Now, in the Arctic region, there is a slight difference in the sense that uh, most of the ice is already floating on water, and therefore, if it melts, it certainly will affect the ecosystems in that region, but it won't have such a major impact on sea level rise. Africa is particularly vulnerable because of low adaptive capacity, because societies are poor. If there are already existing stresses in terms of ecosystems degradation, then uh, the ability of societies to adapt is severely limited. Uh, small island states are particularly vulnerable because sea level rise is going to threaten uh, a large number of the ecosystems and uh, life as well as property in the case of human settlements. Now, the Asian and African mega deltas are also very vulnerable, and this is largely because you have a huge population in a very small area of land, and also because there's a lot of property in some of these mega deltas. And the examples that I'd like to give you of mega deltas in Asia, at least, are cities like Shanghai, uh, Dhaka, Kolkata, these are all cities located on the deltas of rivers, and therefore they are extremely vulnerable to coastal flooding and storm surges, etc. So what do we need to do to win the climate struggle, if I could call it that? Knowledge is what will make a difference. Spreading awareness 
of the science of climate change. And here I'd like to quote Einstein, who said, problems cannot be solved at the level of awareness which created them. You know, we created this problem because apparently there was an adequate awareness all over the world on the implications of increase in greenhouse gas emissions, the implications of burning more and more fossil fuels. So this major problem was created. But you cannot solve this problem at the same level of awareness. So therefore, the only way to solve it, if we are to accept what Einstein said, is to increase the level of awareness by which solutions can be found. So we are now working towards a robust, strong, and comprehensive fifth assessment report of the IPCC. <clears throat> the ER5, as it's called, is well underway. I mentioned to you that uh, we got 3,000 nominations of extremely well-qualified authors. 831 were selected as lead authors and review editors. And the scope has been expanded. It includes uh, issues like clouds and aerosols and what their uh, effect is in uh, the whole climate system. We're looking at geoengineering options. We're looking at sustainability and equity issues. There's going to be a greater focus on socio socioeconomic implications of climate change. So overall, our coverage and emphasis is going to go beyond what we had in the fourth assessment report. And there will also be a synthesis report, which is based on the reports of the three working groups. And uh, I might mention what the three working groups cover. The first one covers the underlying science of climate change. The second working group covers the impacts, uh, adaptation, and vulnerability uh, issues related to climate change. And uh, the third working group deals with mitigation options. So based on the work of all these three working groups and the reports that they bring out, we also produce what is known as a synthesis report. Now, the synthesis report for the AR5 will consist of six major sections. One would deal with observed changes and their causes. Then we'll look at future climate changes, impacts, and the risks associated with them. We look at adaptation and mitigation measures. We look at transformations and changes in systems. Because if we have to bring about solutions worldwide, then we would have to ensure that we chart out the path by which transformation would take place. And this is something that we will assess. Then we will also have a major box which uh, looks at information relevant to Article 2 of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And Article 2 of the Framework Convention, which is really the central objective of the Convention, uh, lays down the objective that we must prevent dangerous in anthropogenic interference with the climate system. In other words, we should take action in such a way that human actions do not lead to a dangerous level of climate change. Now, defining danger is not easy because that involves value judgment. However, science can help us arrive at that value judgment. So what we are attempting to do in the fifth assessment report is essentially to provide uh, the basis, the scientific facts by which negotiators and government delegations can decide where to draw the line and say, Anything beyond this would be dangerous. And this, I think, is an important part. And in very simple terms, um, there is a debate going on right now uh, whether the world should permit a temperature increase of up to 2 degrees Celsius, which is what was discussed in the Cancun conference of the parties, or limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. <coughs> now, the 1.5 degree number would uh, come up only if the world decides that anything beyond a 1.5 degree increase in temperature will actually represent a dangerous level of climate change. So this is a particularly important part of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, we are going to finalize 
the fifth assessment report with the completion of the synthesis report by October 2014. Now, uh, this report will aim to advance our knowledge and understanding of climate change significantly beyond what we already know. But to be honest, what we already know is enough for us to take action. Because after all, we are all risk averse uh, human beings. And it's not just governments, it's not just NGOs, even in business, people assess and evaluate risk when they make investments. But they do make investments. There is no perfect certainty that when you are investing in a new product or a new service, that it will be a resounding financial success. People evaluate risks. And once they are satisfied that, for instance, there is a 60% chance of success from a particular business venture, you go ahead and make the investments that are required. And shareholders are willing to take that kind of risk. So why is it that we are so questioning in terms of uncertainties related to the science of climate change? You know, science will always have some uncertainties associated with it because you're not dealing with a mechanical system. You're dealing with a very complex uh, system involving uh, earth, water, air, and therefore all we can do is to come up with a certain level of confidence by which we can say so and so outcome will occur if so and so level of emissions or concentration of greenhouse gases were to take place. So what we know already is enough for us to take action in the field of climate change and this is something that we must keep in mind. Now, we, what are the kinds of act, actions that we should take? Well, firstly, we have to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Adaptation is crucial, essential, and urgent. Because there are certain, um, what I would say, there's a certain level of inertia in the system, as a result of which, even if we were to uh, hold emissions of greenhouse gases at the level that we have today, we will still see uh, climate change taking place over the next several decades. And therefore, we'll have to adapt to those changes. But globally, if we want to limit the impacts of climate change, if we want to limit some of the problems that we are likely to face in the future, it is essential for us to carry out mitigation of emissions of greenhouse gases. Now, for instance, we have just brought out in May of this year a report on renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation. And in that report, we have looked at the whole range of options available to us in utilizing renewable sources of energy. <clears throat> now, in this report, uh, we energy can accelerate access to energy, particularly for the 1.4 billion people without access to electricity, and the additional 1.3 billion people using traditional biomass. And traditional biomass means uh, very poor quality fuel wood in some cases, uh, animal dung. It also means uh, agricultural residue, and so on. Renewable energy deployment can also reduce vulnerability to supply disruptions and market volatility. So in other words, it would give us higher levels of energy security. <clears throat> because today we know that the demand for oil is going up. And uh, this is true of also other fossil fuels like coal, natural gas. And today the world is going through a recession, but let's say when the recession ends, then the demand will start going up much faster. And supply of these uh, sources of energy is going to be limited <clears throat> in the future by the addition to reserves that we're able to bring about. And as it happens, most of the accretion to reserves is taking place in a very limited region of the world. So there's always the possibility of uh, insecure uh, system of supply of these forms of energy. Renewable energy therefore can enhance energy security. Renewable energy 
can also lead to low risk of severe accidents uh, and it has major environmental and health benefits because if you move to renewable sources of energy you would also reduce emissions at the local level of pollutants that are uh, inevitable whether you burn coal oil or natural gas so by moving to renewable sources of energy you are eliminating all those pollutants which result uh, therefore in an improved situation uh, with human health now average global cumulative renewable energy investment needs in the power sector are below 1% of the world gdp <clears throat> so this is really not a high level of investment and uh, what we really need to do is to put in place policies by which renewable energy sources and their deployment can be accelerated now we are also bringing out before the end of the year an ipcc special report on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters to advance climate change adaptation and uh, the various components of this report would be assessment of regional aspects of vulnerability exposures and impacts assessment of the costs of climate extremes and disasters and a comprehensive assessment of tools to build the capacity for reducing vulnerability and risk at the local national and international levels it will also provide guidance towards integrating disaster risk reduction strategies and climate change adaptation into national policies and programs because our actions will only be effective if they become part of national policies and programs we'll also cover several case studies on extreme events of vulnerable settings and populations and of management approaches by which we can deal with these extreme events now science can therefore be a driver for adaptation which i mentioned earlier as well as mitigation actions and we came up with the conclusion that neither adaptation nor mitigation alone can avoid all climate change impacts however they can complement each other and together can significantly reduce the risks of climate change so we need to put in place policies that deal with adaptation as well as mitigation around the world now the role and limits of adaptation of course uh, have to be defined and have been defined in the fourth assessment report we know that societies have a long record of adapting to the impacts of weather and climate after all climate change weather related changes have taken place throughout history and societies and communities have learned how to deal with them but climate change poses new risks that will certainly exceed our capacities to adapt thus far <clears throat> and therefore adaptation is necessary to address the impacts resulting from the warming which is already unavoidable due to past emissions so as i said there's a certain inertia in the system you cannot bring about instant changes it's going to take a long period of time before we can stabilize the climate of this planet but adaptation alone is not expected to cope with all the projected effects of climate change there is substantial potential for the mitigation of global greenhouse gas emissions um, <clears throat> over the coming decades okay and what are these well firstly it is important for us to remember that all stabilization levels assessed by the ipcc can be achieved by deployment of a portfolio of technologies that are currently available or expected to be commercialized in coming decades so i think for us to make the excuse that we have to wait for new technologies to come along is not tenable we have the right technologies we have public transport we have efficient buildings we have all kinds of innovations which are used in some part of the world or the other and therefore we can say quite confidently that to embark on a path of mitigation we have all the technologies that are either available or are on the verge of being commercialized but if we have to bring about change in the future we'll have to have appropriate and effective incentives so that these technologies 
are not only developed, but they are acquired and deployed and diffused on a large scale across the population of the globe. So policies are going to be critical in determining how technology is used in the future. Uh, we would need regulations and standards. We would need taxes and charges. We would need appropriate energy infrastructure investments, uh, research, development, and demonstration. And most importantly, we need an effective carbon price, uh, which would provide a signal to the market by which producers and consumers can move towards low carbon products and supply systems. So a price on carbon is perhaps the most effective means by which we can bring about mitigation. And I want to highlight the fact that if we want to limit the temperature increase of this planet to between, between say 2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius, then if we want to do that on a least cost basis, then we have a very short period of time because we clearly assess that uh, CO2 emissions would need to peak no later than 2015 if we want to pursue a least cost path of mitigation to limit temperature increase to the, this particular level. So I want you to concentrate only on the top level of the presentation. Uh, the topmost line of numbers that you see over there. Will this be expensive? No, it certainly won't, because all this means is that if we were to carry out no mitigation at all, then GDP, let's say, would increase in this manner. And if we were to carry out mitigation, GDP would reduce uh, in the manner that is shown over here. In other words, this line would bend a little downwards, and in effect, what this means is that the cost of mitigation in 2030 would be less than 3% of the global GDP. This is what we have assessed. Uh, and what this implies is that the level of prosperity that we would reach in 2030 would at best be delayed by a few months or a year. Now, that is clearly not a high price to pay for avoiding or delaying some of the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, I think it's important for us to see that uh, science is the driver of discussion and debate in COP17, as you know, which will take place in Durban this year, in uh, November, December of this year. Uh, <clears throat> we need to understand that there's a deeper understanding and quantification of uh, the processes that have progressed rapidly since the, the IPCC first assessment report, which came out in 1990. And these advances have come from new data, more sophisticated analysis of data, improvements in understanding and simulation of physical processes, and more extensive exploration of uncertainty ranges. So science has moved on, it will continue to move on, and we must employ it for the benefit of humanity. <clears throat> we had assessed that beyond the Kyoto Protocol, if we want to limit temperature increase to say 2 degrees Celsius, then developed countries would need to reduce their emissions below 1990 levels between 10 to 40 percent by 2020 and between 40 to 95 percent by 2050. <clears throat> but Developing country emissions would also need to deviate uh, below business as usual. So I think we really need a global effort, and that's precisely why the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, laid down this principle of common but differentiated responsibility. So it's a common responsibility, but uh, it has to be differentiated in terms of who can do what and developed countries are expected to do much more for a variety of reasons. What we really need to do is to spread awareness by which policy making can be influenced, signals, the right signals can be sent to the market, and we can carry out direct mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions through changes in consumption behavior, and this includes lifestyle changes. <coughs> Now, sustainable development and climate change have 
two-way relationships um, because sustainable development would ensure that we limit the emissions of greenhouse gases, which means it would limit climate change. But climate change would also limit our ability to pursue sustainable development, simply because, uh, let's say, if areas are impacted seriously by the uh, effects of climate change, then <clears throat> it would limit their ability to be able to pursue sustainable development <clears throat> because of the damage that climate change might cause to those communities and their infrastructure. And here let me emphasize again what Einstein said, problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. So, um, therefore, what I would submit is the following. Science has progressed substantially. We know enough by which action can be taken. But the only way action will be taken, particularly in democratic societies, is if people understand what would be the impacts of inaction and how attractive it is to take action. Now, in the case of the impacts of inaction, we know that the impacts of climate change will be very serious, will have impacts on water, on human health, on food security. Uh, it will take the form of higher intensity and frequency of extreme events, which includes floods, droughts, heat waves, and uh, extreme precipitation. Uh, the impacts on sea level in terms of increase in sea level rise uh, would have serious implications. But while all this is uh, bad news, the good news is that we can carry out mitigation of emissions of greenhouse gases and attempt to stabilize the climate of this planet by adopting technologies, by adopting policies and lifestyles that would rapidly reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. So the choices are very clear before us. And I think the only way we can exercise enlightened choices would be through knowledge, through the creation and dissemination of knowledge. And that's what scientists and their partners need to do. It's not enough to produce knowledge and to produce excellent reports, which I hope the IPCC will continue to do, but also to be able to disseminate the results of these reports. So I'll stop over here and I would be very happy to take questions from all, all of you. Thank you. Dr. Bachari, on behalf of everybody who's been listening and watching your presentation, we wish you thank you very much. As moderator, thank you. I'd like to make, uh, thank you, sir, uh, one comment, and I don't know, Danielle, if you've got the one slide here being seen by folks in other places. If not, anyway, um, so I would comment that in my school here, four of your 831 lead or, or co-authors uh, come from our school here in Hawaii. And um, as a geologist and geophysicist, I can say that we're headed into new territory. The natural course of the Earth would be to go back into an ice age. We're going in the other direction. And we're going into it at rates that are unprecedented historically. So I just want to emphasize Dr. Bachari's points. And, and I don't know whether this slide is seen by others now. But this is data on the left-hand set of panels from Hawaii. Uh, in the top is the uh, temperature rise. This is all over 100 years. Uh, from left to right, that's, the scale is small. There's 100 years of temperature in the top sea level, the next one, a local uh, stream gauge, then a rainfall index, and the bottom left has the CO2 history from the Keeling curve and the observatory on Mauna Loa, and more recently from Station Aloha, both the increase in CO2 at sea and the decrease in pH, i.e. the ocean acidification, uh, that is measured. None of these data are model dependent. They're all actual measurements. So this is not a function. When I say Hawaii's future is on trend to be warmer, 
and drier, susceptible to severe storms and coastal erosion, with depleted fisheries and stressed coral reef systems, that's just looking at the trends over the last 100 years. It is not saying anything about models or forecasts or anything. It's just if you extrapolate those trends that are measured, that's what we're facing here in Hawaii. Now, I'd like to uh, go around the many people who have uh, been on this uh, presentation from Dr. Bachari online, and if I can figure out how to do this, uh, perhaps starting with uh, the UN University, if you'd like to ask Dr. Bachari some questions. Brendan, your group. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. Bachari, for a very interesting lecture. We do have some questions. Good afternoon, sir. Thanks. It's very nice to be with you. And uh, thanks for the, this particular role of IPCC about telling us where we are and where we are moving. But uh, I'm a social science student, so my question is not related to the scientific findings, but based on the mitigation measures. My question is that, sir, that regarding you have always emphasized on the sustainable development. Through the sustainable development and linking with the climate change, we can achieve the mitigation measure. But on the name of sustainable development, uh, the government, the market-driven economy, it's very suitable for them. They are accepting it without any hesitation so that they can grow up. Like uh, just recently in Brazil, Mole Monte Dam has been approved million of hectares of land is going to be submerged in the line of like in India, Sardar Sarovar Dam. And right now, a lot of uh, tribal area and forest are going for the development projects in the name of sustainable development. We are listening this sustainable development in India at least for 10 years or more. How far it has been benefited to us, whether there is any empirical evidence of that or we are just making them, uh, finding a mid-path between the, this market-driven economy and the government. See that this is the suitable, you can survive with the sustainable development, but actually, the, what is the result? That's my question. Won't we say that goodbye to sustainable development? Thank you, sir. Okay, well, thank you very much. May I just add another uh, question very quickly? And that is, um, with regard to the scope of the uh, fifth assessment report, I just wondered whether you are taking into consideration um, the work that's been done on peak oil and uh, the research that's indicating we may see a peak in conventional uh, oil production between 2015 to 2020. Now the fifth assessment is coming out in October 2014. If you don't take into account that kind of research, then uh, we may find ourselves in some difficulty if peak oil is already upon us and we have not considered how to mitigate that without actually destroying the climate at the same time. Thank you, that's all from the UNU. Okay, let me respond to those uh, two questions, but first, uh, <clears throat> may I um, thank our moderator for showing us data from Hawaii. Uh, it's critically important that people understand that whatever findings we have come up with, uh, are based on observation, and there is no theorizing over there. Uh, so thank you very much, because that uh, clearly strengthens the point that I was get, trying to get across. On the two questions that have been asked from UNU, um, the first gentleman described, I'm afraid, what is totally unsustainable development. I mean, you, sir, were harping on the term sustainable development, that all this is being done in the name of sustainable development, uh, the reality is that that represents unsustainable development. You know, if you are going to flood large areas of forest land, if you are going to uproot large numbers of people uh, in implementing a particular project, that flies in the face of sustainable development. Sustainable development is that form of development which helps meet the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. You know, there are some people who I will not name, uh, will tell you why worry about the Maldive Islands 
if sea level rise is going to submerge those islands, resettle those people somewhere else. Now, can we just completely ignore uh, the place of human culture, uh, the strength of local practices, the fact that people want to be born and want to die on the land which they have inherited? Is that of no value at all? In my view, anything that completely ignores the human dimensions of uh, development is unsustainable. So may I say that the examples that you were quoting, sir, are precisely those which are totally unsustainable. We have to look at alternatives by which we ensure that the natural resources of this planet are not destroyed to a level where the services that they provide to society and other species uh, go down to negative levels. On the second question about peak oil, yes, we are going to look at, you know, when you talk about peak oil and you talk about growing demand for energy, uh, it's obvious that this imbalance will lead to much higher prices of oil. Now, <clears throat> the IPCC functions on the basis of uh, published literature and certainly if there is a lot of published literature as I know there is we would take that into account in looking at future scenarios of prices that we are likely to confront and therefore we will certainly evaluate options by which uh, we can develop in a least cost manner and yet be able to meet the challenge of climate change so to answer your question, yes, to the extent that peak oil and how it translates into either physical restrictions in supply or uh, increase in prices of oil uh, will certainly be taken into account based on the literature that we are able to access. And uh, this certainly would be a very important input, if I may say, in determining the kinds of energy choices the world has to make in the future. Could I ask uh, for one question from Waseda University, please? We have one question from student. Hi, my name is April. Uh, thank you for your lecture. My question is about carbon dioxide levels and its emissions. Um, well, firstly, you mentioned that the CO2 emissions and the level must be considerably reduced by 2015, which is in four years. Um, well, the UK and the US have been the main and the largest contributors to CO2 emissions, but recently we see uh, developing countries um, also uh, emitting a significant amount. And um, well, I think that developed countries and developing countries um, are facing different situations, so therefore they have different problems to deal with. And I agree that um, national policies are the first step towards uh, reducing CO2 emissions, but I also think that the next step should be international policies. Um, so my question for you is, how do you plan to use uh, your research and the data that you have collected to influence the largest CO2 emitters, uh, which is China and the US now, to lower their emissions? Thank you. Well, that's a good question, but firstly, let me say that the problem is not being caused by present emissions. It's a question of cumulative emissions, which have brought about an increase in the concentration of these greenhouse gases. And therefore, I think the historical context is important. It's also important to look at per capita emission levels, and this has been the basis of negotiations and discussions ever since uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, was being drafted and was being agreed on. So we need to look at all these aspects and uh, I wouldn't want to pronounce an opinion one way or the other. But on what is it that the IPCC is doing? <clears throat> well, the IPCC has learned a few lessons. We were really not disseminating the results of our work effectively. Our communications effort um, was uh, totally inadequate. And this is largely because uh, we have a very lean secretariat. You'd be surprised that the IPCC for about 17 years had a secretariat of only five people up to 2005. 
now we have about 10 people but really if you ask me if we have to mount a major effort in disseminating our findings we need a group of four or five just communications experts in the ipcc secretariat uh, but the government have to decide to provide the resources the funds for us to get the right people and we have to come up with a program of action however in the absence of that what we are relying on is to work with partners because as i said earlier in democratic uh, societies uh, the best way to get action is to inform the public so um, this is where i think we as individuals can also make a difference gandhi was right when he said be the change you want to see in the world if each one of us acts in a particular way then certainly we would be able to deal with the problem effectively however i agree with you that we need an international agreement but that's a very complex process and it has been going on for almost 20 years now uh, with less than adequate results as i showed you between 1970 and 2004 there has been an increase of 70% in emissions of greenhouse gases that is testimony to the fact that we are not doing enough i hope that the global community understands the science of climate change and comes up with an agreement which is effective at the global level and which also assists countries communities and societies to implement actions in the right direction thank you we'll take one question here from uh, the university of hawaii I didn't hear that question. Could please? Yeah. Can you hear me? No. Now I can. I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. So my understanding is that in addition to observational data, the IPCC uses models, correct? I'm sorry. In addition to what? In, in, sorry. In addition to uh, data, the IPCC uses models. That, that's correct, Dr. Yes, Sorry. of course. A absolutely. And so the question. And so the question is. So the question is, I've always been curious about the input into these models and how they've been refined over time. So the question relates to the input to those models, how they've been refined, and how that affects the results. Well, that's a very good question, and let me respond by saying that you know, climate science has uh, advanced substantially and we run a large number of models uh, the ipcc doesn't run them uh, this is really the research community which is involved in modeling and we take the results of those models but to explain how this is done is that typically a model would be run with inputs involving human action which means the increase in emissions of greenhouse gases and the concentration of these gases it's also they are they also run with the inputs of natural factors which involves solar activ activity like sunspots uh, it also includes terrestrial natural activities like uh, uh, volcanoes and volcanic eruptions and so on and how we validate these models is to go back in time uh, let's say we look at the last 100 years we have all the observations of temperature changes and other changes which have occurred we'll uh, sort of carry out an exercise to run our models going back in time let's say to 100 years and projecting the numbers that we get as a result the good news is that uh, an ensemble of these models and their results when put together give us almost a perfect fit as far as the past past is concerned and of course these are very complex models they are run on very powerful supercomputers because there's just so much of uh, uh there's there's so much of number crunching that has to be carried out for different uh, locations 
and uh, different uh, areas of the world put together. Uh, but I must say the extent of reliability that we have with these models now uh, is very heartening. And therefore, as a result, we can say that the projections that we come up with for the future are pretty robust, very reliable, and with very le low levels of uncertainty. Uh, but these models are critical to our understanding of what would happen in the future. However, each one of them has been validated uh, on the basis of past observations and their ability to predict the past when you go back in time. If you have time, Doctor, I'd like to take one question first from KEO University and finish with one question from the Ryukyus. KEO University, please. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> students do not have a question at this point, but there's just one uh, a point I'd like to get uh, the attention, not just from Dr. Bachari, but everybody else. In Japan, since March, we're going through a very difficult time, partly because of the nuclear power plant problem. One of the problems in the context of this class is, the, in a way, the issue of securing energy source pretty much overshadowed the issue of global warming. This is the biggest problem. One could argue, on the one hand, that, okay, this may be a good opportunity to think about a different type of uh, alternative source of energy, but ordinary people, in a way, are far more concerned with how to secure the energy, um, the source of energy. So this is where we are at right now in Japan. Everyone talks about anti-nuclear uh, power, but on the other hand, they do not pay attention to other alternatives and how much time and money would cost to develop alternative uh, source of energy. One more point to confirm this, in a way, is just I, I have to think more personally, but I have to think about the timing. Around March 11, something happened in Northern Africa, uh, almost sort of a coincidental, but I, I sometimes wonder if it's just a coincidence. British and uh, French uh, Air Force bombed Tripoli, and that was just one of those sort of, uh, you know, um, some kind of coincidence, but I started wondering. Now, we all know the danger of nuclear power, power but at the same time, so we don't know what the alternative is. We don't want to go back to uh, pre-1950s or even pre-1945. I think this is a major problem. We can talk about global warming, but at the ordinary people's life, they are more concerned with how to secure the energy, energy source. So if uh, anyone or particularly from Dr. Bachari, if you have any sort of a, a sort of uh, insight on this, would be, would be really happy to hear it. And uh, one more point, our campus managed to cut down on the use of electricity by 15 to 20 percent over the summer, even though we had one of the hottest summer. So on the individual organizational level or individual's level, effort can be made. But this sort of a micro level of activities and a micro level of uh, issues, somehow we are having all kinds of difficulty of reconciling this two level huge discrepancy. It's more like a comment and I'd like to get some feedback, so it'd be very nice. Thank you. Thank sure, you I think that's a, that's a very valid comment. That's a very valid comment. But let me say I'm a great admirer of what Japan has done and is capable of doing. If you go back in time to the first oil price shock of 1973-74, if there was one society that really reacted purposefully, it was Japan. You uh, shut down a number of your energy intensive industries. You moved from uh, imports of oil for a large number of activities to imports of natural gas. You brought about major improvements in energy efficiency. Now, taking all that into account, I realize that any adjustment or shift in the future is not going to be easy. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be time consuming. It will probably involve a great deal of decade, uh, a great deal of debate. But may I also say that you partly answered that question by telling us about what your campus was able to achieve during this summer. I think there is still, despite the fact that 
uh, Japan is so energy efficient, there is still a great deal of scope for improving the efficiency of energy use. So that buys you a little bit of time. The debate on nuclear energy is a very complex one, and I don't have a position one way or the other. I think it is for society in any country to decide whether they want nuclear power or not. My own perception is that Japan will settle for continuing with nuclear energy, with, of course, enhanced safeguards, with uh, much better oversight of the management of these plants and so on and so forth. But it's going to be a very difficult transition. At the same time, I think uh, renewable energy sources give us uh, a great deal of hope, but this would require substantial research and development, and as I said earlier, a mix of policies that makes it possible not only to develop these technologies, but also to disseminate them on a large scale. So to, to put it <coughs> in a nutshell, it's a huge challenge. There will be a major effort at bringing about a transition, but may I say if there's one society that can do it, it is Japanese society. So I wish you all the best. Dr. Jabari, I'm, I'm cognizant it's eight past the hour, and I'm not sure of your schedule. So I want to ask you, sir, whether you'd entertain I, two more questions. I'm not sure Can I take on. one more question? Can we one make this the last question, if I... Okay. Thank you, sir. The uh, Ryukyus, could you please ask Japan, one last question? From the Institute of Technology, we have a few questions. Please, Can you hear me? Time, time to can you hear me? Hi. Dr. Pacheri, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, last two questions. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember last time, uh, in the last uh, year, I asked you about the uh, religious uh, way to uh, put some rules in uh, regulation in, against uh, climate change. But now uh, my question is kind of very strange, but I'm a very optimistic person, but sometimes I feel very pessimistic about the human nature. So um, I imagine it, it's very hard for everybody to accept very harsh rules to reduce our, uh, our way of life uh, by simply uh, scientific uh, information. But it's, uh, it's uh, any way that you can assess the risk of kind of very fearful uh, future. Sometimes uh, I guess the most biggest uh, fear for human society is kind of uh, war against or uh, conflict between large populations. So is there any way to uh, simulate or estimate the risk change in conflict between big organizations or uh, maybe even countries or uh, groups of countries. Thank you. Well, um, let me say that uh, we ha have come up with projections of changes and impacts that would take place if no action is taken uh, on climate change. And uh, those can then be converted into the risks of conflict, as you mentioned. Uh, just to give you an example, as early as 2020, we have projected that in Africa there would be anywhere from 75 to 250 million people living in a state of water stress. Now that's a huge number. And Africa and other parts of the world already have water stress. And that's going to be exacerbated, that's going to be increased as a result of climate change. And if you have such large numbers living in a state of acute scarcity of a critical element like water, there is clearly uh, the possibility of conflict. But that's really for other specialists to determine. I think it's for social scientists and others to determine what the extent of risk would be uh, associated with these changes. So this is a very relevant issue, and I would like to see social scientists and others spending a lot more time and effort 
in looking at some of these questions because all of this will help our understanding on what would happen if we take no action on climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bachari. My apologies to the University of the Rick Youth for getting cut off there. I'd like, on behalf of everybody in, as part of this, to thank the doctor for this wonderful presentation and answering of the questions. And so we'd allow you to uh, leave the uh, joint proceedings, and I'd hand it back over to Brendan Barrett at uh, UNU. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much.